My name is Larry Noble. I'm the President and CEO of Americans for Campaign Reform, one of the co-sponsors of this evening. I first want to thank the Daniels College of Business and the University of Denver for putting this on, and also our co-sponsors, the American Sustainable Business Council, the Committee for Economic Development, Enterprise Holdings, and of course, Brian Malone and his documentary film, Patriocracy. Um, we'll be t what's going to happen now is I'm going to do a short introduction. We'll be showing, uh, Brian's going to introduce his film. The film will be shown. We'll have a panel. We'll have an opportunity for questions after the panel. And then there will be a reception back at my hotel room. No, that's not true. There'll be a reception, which you're all invited to attend. Just joking. Um, that you're all invited to attend afterwards, and we hope you all do. I, as I said, I think we have a fascinating evening, evening for you tonight, and a very important evening. Um, we live, and this is not going to come as a surprise to anybody, but we live in politically dysfunctional times. Uh, we live in times that are really focused on partisanship and slogans. That seems to make up our political debate right now. And the partisanship and slogans are often um, fueled by anger and misinformation. And that has, unfortunately, replaced rational debate. Our elections have become financial arms races to see who can raise the most money. And like most arms races, they don't generally end happily. Um, those who win the most money appear to control the debate and the agenda. Brian Malone's film, Patriocracy, looks at how and why democracy has become dominated by extreme partisanship. It examines the problem through the eyes and the voices of those people who are closest to it and who know what they're talking about. One of those voices is Senator Alan Simpson, who is a co-chair of Americans for Campaign Reform. Uh, he is prominent in the film and makes a compelling case for the problems and the solutions. And I have to say, as a personal matter, we are very proud of his service and deeply appreciate his support of our organization. But make no mistake about it, the problems the film exposes are real and should be con of concern to every one of you, concern of anyone who cares about our country. Thankfully, the film also offers hope, and hopes for, hope for a future where we will be able to come to some meeting of minds, have rational debate, and have a government that is responsive to the people. And have a government where the debate is not captured by ideologies or single issue ideologies and money. As the film points out, the dependence on wealth and special interest funders um, who people, candidates need to fund their campaign, and this is on both sides of the aisle, is a major problem. We are co-sponsoring this event because we believe it is a major problem and we support small donor public funding of campaigns. As a personal matter, I will tell you that I'm involved in this now because I've spent, and I don't want to admit this, but I've spent 37 years as a lawyer in the campaign finance field. I was general counsel of the Federal Election Commission enforcing the laws. I spent six years with um, Center for Responsive Politics, which does the website opensecrets.org, and then I took a bit of a turn. And I represented, I uh, went to a large law firm, and I practiced political law representing corporations and individuals um, wanting to take part in a political process. And I can tell you that they think money influences politics. They're very bottom line oriented. They wouldn't do it if they didn't think it was very, very bottom line oriented for them and didn't produce a lot for them. Right now, we have a system that is pretty simple, actually, and it's pretty simple in terms of money and politics. It's a, simple, it's a simple system where if I want something, I know that what I have to do is raise the most money for a candidate or give the most money for a candidate. That will get me the most money, the can, uh, that will get me the most access to the candidate once the candidate is elected. So if I want something, bottom line, I'll pay for it. I may not like that system, and I had a lot of clients telling me they didn't like the system. I may not like that system, but it is the system that, that exists. It's a simple business decision. At the same time, they're spending money to influence the debate with misinformation and a very one-note ideology about whatever interest concerns them. So the voter is hearing this very narrow debate, is getting this information from the same people who are funding the candidates. Now you're a candidate, and you want to run for office. What do you do? You look around and you say, I need money. Where are you going to get the money? From those people who want something and want access. 
And also, you have to be concerned that now your voters have received all this information from those same people. So if I'm the candidate, it's a very simple proposition under our current system. I have to go where the money is. And that's somebody, corporate America, answering. Um, <laughs> so you have access to the candidate while they're a candidate, but more importantly, you have access to the candidate once they become an elected official. The result is that the needs of, the public, of, of citizens and the public take a back seat to the agenda of special interests. And what does that do? It not only changes our policy, but it alienates the voters. It leaves only the special interest money and the most ideolo ideologically extreme people committed to doing something about government. Other people feel, I can't play in that, in that world. I can't write a $2,500 contribution or raise $500,000. And since these people control the debate, Where's my voice? In all of my 30-something years of doing this, I've co and come to this conclusion, money in politics is the framing issue for every other issue. I don't care what your other issue is, what you care about. The environment, taxes, gun control, immigration. Follow the money, because that is what's going to frame the issue. Unless you get control of that money, you will, have not, you will not have control of the system. This is not just political science, it has serious implications for our country and our democracy. A healthy democracy cannot long endure if the voters are alienated. Just because we have voting doesn't mean we have a democracy. There are a lot of countries that have voting, and they're not true democracies. Simply put, we need to act together, and we need to act quickly. Time is not on our side. But I want to leave you the hopeful message. Things can change. If we act together and we do stuff, things can change. We can change the money and politics system. If we don't, I think the future doesn't look very bright for us. If we do, we can really, we can really meet our destiny and what our democracy was meant to be. And I think that's what Brian Malone is going to say to you in this film. Um, with that, I want to turn I want to turn it over to Brian uh, to explain why he felt compelled to make this film. As I said, after the film, there will be a question and answer session. I thank you for all coming. And go out there and do something. Brian? Thanks, everyone. Has anyone seen a green and blue tie? I make a joke that I never wear a tie, but I actually have a tie. I lost it. Anyone seen it? No? <clears throat> if you see it, it's mine. A loose tie floating around. Uh, I'm so glad you're all here tonight. Thank you really for coming. It's a great, great house, and um, I'm so looking forward to having you see this film. Uh, I want to thank all of our wonderful panelists, Americans for Campaign Reform, and um, Daniels College of Business, Haven, and Rob, and everyone uh, for putting this together. It's just really thrilling. Um, thanks for coming out. Um, I'd like to read a little passage from a popular book to kind of get us in the mood. Um, a little book called um, Fifty Shades of Grey, <laughs> so I think we'll clearly illustrate what I'm saying. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> As her black silken negligee, no, I'm sorry, that's the wrong <laughs> chapter. Here we go. Here we go. Our democracy is not black or white. Uh, any of the issues that we all face as Americans are not black or white either. Um, any issue, whether it's health care, gun control, balancing the budget, has 50 shades of gray. Um, and it's in those 50 shades of gray that the real magic of our democracy exists. Uh, because gray is made up of black and white, or red or blue or whatever you want to call it. Um, and frankly, it's that combination of ideas that has gotten our democracy through the last 235, 240 years. Uh, it's not always easy, and that's okay. As long as the debate is healthy and spirited, and in the end, we get that good faith compromise that yields um, a healthy democracy. That's my idea of a good democracy anyway. Uh, so even though it's a lot easier for us to kind of gravitate towards the black or gravitate towards the white, um, I would advise you all to 
um, you know, steer towards the 50 shades of gray or the red or blue or whatever you want um, and really investigate the issues, become knowledgeable about them and listen to each other, especially those who have views who you don't agree with because that's where you'll learn the most. Really sexy stuff, I'm telling you, <laughs> our democracy. Anyway, look, I'm, I'm uh, really thrilled to be here. It's kind of why I made the film. Uh, there are a lot of really smart people here tonight that are going to um, give us their ideas, and I'm looking forward to listening to all of them, and uh, I hope you are too. And as they say in Hollywood, roll it! Another round of applause for the film. While I think there were a lot of sadly amusing moments in the film, I hope it all inspired you all, and you can see why it is so important. Um, and make, it should make you think a lot, especially with tomorrow. You know, tomorrow we have a debate, the first presidential debate. Make you think a lot about what we, what we are facing here. And also, like to say, you can see why we love Alan Simpson as our co-chair. Um, he speaks very bluntly and forcefully. Um, right now, um, I'd like to invite our esteemed panelists to begin the discussion on the topics highlighted in the film. And I'm honored to introduce our moderator, Neil Westergaard, editor of the Denver Business Journal. I guess panelists want to start coming up. Um, Neil uh, has been a newspaper reporter and editor in Colorado for more than 35 years. He began his career in 1974 at Colorado Springs Sun. Uh, he was appointed executive editor of the Denver Post in 1991. In 1999, he was named editor of the Denver Business Journal, where, in addition to managing its staff of reporters and editors, he writes a weekly editorial column. Welcome, Neil, and take it over. You can turn it on. Oh, yeah. I think. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, Before I introduce our panel, I just want to. Uh, share something with you. Uh, Brian Malone and I had lunch uh, last week and uh, he told me a story uh, that he talked to the Alan Simpson about this and Alan Simpson said, you know, Brian, you have really done something significant here and I just want to echo that and uh, give another round of applause to Brian for producing a terrific movie. Well, it's my privilege to serve as, uh, as your moderator. Um, I want to mention that after we have a little bit of a chat here uh, about the movie and some of the issues raised in it, we're going to have mics out in the audience and we'll be taking uh, audience questions at that time. So be thinking about what you would like to ask these folks uh, uh, and, and we'll have Brian up as well uh, so you can ask him questions about the movie uh, as well. One thing I would caution you, though, let's, uh, let's try to keep this uh, nonpartisan and uh, let's ask questions and not make political statements when we get to that point. Uh, panelists, you're free to make political statements, however. Um, well, first I want to introduce our panel members. Uh, uh, to my uh, far left is uh, former Senator Hank Brown. Uh, he is uh, very familiar to uh, DU students and to most people in Colorado. He was a congressman for how many five terms, I think, before you were elected to the U.S. Senate. Um, he is both an attorney and a CPA. Uh, interesting combination. He's taught here at the university. He's the uh, 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 senior counsel at the law firm of uh, uh, Brownstein, Hyatt, Farber, Schreck in Denver. Uh, he's also served as the uh, president of the University of Colorado and the University of Northern Colorado in Greeley. Um, uh, when he was uh, CU president, the Wall Street Journal named him as the best college president you've never heard of. <laughs> so please welcome uh, Senator Hank Brown. Uh, uh, to my immediate left is Gerald Greenwald. Uh, uh, Gerald is a managing partner of Greenbrier Equity Group. He's chairman emeritus of United Airlines. Uh, he founded Greenbrier uh, with Joel Beckman and Reginald Jones. Uh, he's formed a strategic alliance with Berkshire Partners to make private equity investments in the global transportation sector. He, was, uh, he is chairman emeritus of United Airlines from 1994 until his retirement in 1999. 
Uh, he was chairman and CEO of United Airlines. And in his five years with United, he led the airline through its beginnings as the world's largest majority employee-owned company, helped return it to profitability and build its leadership position throughout the world. So please welcome Gerald Greenwald. <laughs> to Jerry's uh, left uh, is the former governor of Louisiana, Buddy Romer. Um, uh, he has also served in uh, Congress, representing the 4th District in Louisiana. He's been very, very outspoken about campaign reform. Uh, recently testified before uh, the Senate on uh, campaign ref reform issues. He ran for president uh, earlier in 2012 uh, and uh, really uh, raised a lot of issues about inclusiveness uh, uh, among uh, uh, the parties. Um, he is... Uh, he began his uh, political career in 1972 when he was elected uh, to, as a delegate to the U Louisiana Constitutional Convention, uh, then worked for uh, Edwin Edwards' campaign for governor with his father and uh, had a political uh, consulting firm. Um, he uh, uh, lost his first bid for the U.S. Uh, House of Representatives, then ran again two years later and uh, won the seat and then was uh, elected uh, in 1988 uh, as uh, governor of Louisiana. So please welcome Governor Buddy Romer. And finally, I'd like to introduce you to somebody who I know you're familiar with here at DU. <laughs> Kim Jordan is the co-founder of one of Colorado's largest and most successful brewing companies, New Belgium Brewing. Uh, she's uh, cultivated a passion for social work and the environment uh, and the community uh, to create one of the most respected craft breweries uh, in America. She got her master's in social work from CSU and worked as an advocate for women's issues uh, and family health at uh, Project Self-Sufficiency. Uh, that background has found its way into the progressive policies at the company she co-founded, which is employee-owned, and subscribes to the principles of open book management and philanthropic giving. Uh, she's a director on the boards of uh, One Percent for the Planet and the Brewers Association Services. Services uh, serves as a member of Governor uh, Renewable Energy uh, Authority Board. Um, please welcome Ms. Kim Jordan. I want to start out with uh, a. a, a raised uh, by Bob Schieffer in the movie, who I also thought was uh, pretty on point with, with some of these issues. And uh, Senator Brown, um, excuse me, um, you both When did it go bad? We talked about how it's gone bad, but when did it begin to go bad in your opinion? And what were the, what were the, the, the initial factors that caused it to get to the point where we are today, or begin to get to the point where we are today? Hank's older than I am. Why don't you go first, Hank? <laughs> <laughs> My impression is that uh, while certainly the crisis that we're in now uh, has raised the level of rhetoric, that it uh, has been uh, intense and uh, uh, partisan from the very beginning of our country. And you look at uh, the journals of opinion in the Revolutionary War, uh, you look at the uh, uh, literally uh, members of Congress beating each other with canes in the Civil War. Uh, what we're seeing now is not a dramatic break. Uh, what I think you see, though, I identify two phenomena that I think are different. One is a dramatic change in America. Prior to the revolution, prior to the 1930s, we never had a year where we spent more than 10 percent of the gross national product with the federal government or by all levels of government combined. There were a couple years, I think, in the Civil War, or buddy, the War of Northern Aggression, I think, as your folks might say. Uh, there were a couple years where we went over 10 percent. But since 1930, there hasn't been a year where we've been under 10 percent, and now state, federal, all levels combined, we're at 40 percent. So we've had a dramatic increase in the share of goods and services that are spent by government. And along with it, we've developed a fantasy, a fantasy that uh, 
we can have a war in Afghanistan or Iraq and not pay for it, or that we can have entitlement programs and not adjust the benefits to meet the resources. Currently, I think, as you know, we're $99 trillion short on, of unfunded liabilities uh, in the entitlement programs. That's more than all the assets of every American combined. To pretend that we uh, can afford all these things um, is fantasy. And I think that's where we need to begin. Is it nice to be civil to everybody? Absolutely. But that civility will come as we deal with problems. I think fundamentally what we have to do is have a balanced budget amendment that forces us to either curtail spending or raise taxes or both to begin to deal with our problems. I, I think uh, to follow up on what Hank said, uh, Neil, I, I, to me, I'm 68. I was elected to Congress when I was 35 and elected governor. I was 43. By the way, the night I was elected governor of Louisiana was a big upset. I got a phone call from some guy in Colorado named Romer. He says, uh, two down, 48 to go, buddy. <laughs> uh, but, but my experience and my study of history is that the, the one thing that's changed is the power of money. Money's always been important, and it's always been in politics. But when it reaches a certain level, under the table, in the dark, from a few you never know, it's called institutional corruption. And I think Washington is not just broken. It's always had its moment of break. It's fragile. But it's not just broken. It's bought. We are a nation in trouble, and it won't get fixed by a president who's owned by the Wall Street banks or by a president who's owned by the insurance companies when it comes to health care or a president who's not free to lead. And it, I've been out of politics for almost 25 years, happy. I build community banks. You know, I, I've worked my way to some wealth and had a lot of happiness. But this time, I just couldn't stand by anymore. I saw a banking bill passed in Congress, bank reform, where too big to fail is still the law, isn't it? It's still the law. Where Glass-Steagall is still dead, isn't it? Where capital ratios don't go up with size, they go down. And our president goes to Wall Street the next week after signing the bill, has a fundraiser, $35,400 a ticket, and it's sponsored by Goldman friggin' Sachs. So, so I agree with everything Hank said. And maybe it was Thomas Jefferson who ended the film. Let me add another quote from Thomas, who said that a nation that expects to be both free and ignorant expects what never was and never will be. We are a nation in trouble. Last month, we created 96,000 jobs and 415,000 people got on food stamps. Last month, last month, 472,000 people quit looking for work. Last month, in the third year of a recovery, we're a nation in trouble, and I think it's because Washington is bought and we've got to take it back. So you don't buy into the... Uh... So you don't buy into the president's uh, statements that uh, food stamps are a form of economic stimulus because people are out buying food and things like that. Well, I take food stamps seriously. They're an important part of America. This country is in better, off, in better shape it's better off for the average citizen than it's ever been. I mean, women can actually vote now. <laughs> African Americans, who are a third of the population in my state, actually count. I mean, I love America, so don't misunderstand me. That's not the problem. The problem is that 99% of the people don't give a penny to politics, do they? I ran and took no PAC money. I was the only member of Congress, Hank, that took no PAC money when I was there in the 1980s. The only one. I take no PAC money, no super PAC money, $100 limit, and report everything. 
I tried to get five million Americans to stand with me. That's $500 million. I'd be your president. But you know I didn't get invited to a single Republican debate. There were 23 nationally scheduled Republicans debates. I didn't get invited to a single one. We'd call each time. I'm the only person running who'd been a congressman and a governor. And every time they'd say the same thing. Have you raised 500000 in the last 60 days, governor? Wow. That's how we elect presidents. Money affects us not only who wins, but who runs. How would you like to have a debate day after tomorrow with Barack Obama and Mitt Romney and a character like Buddy Romer and we'd talk about America and solutions? Our problem is not that money goes one place or another and not that money's in the dark and not that money comes from special interest only. Those are all problems. But the problem is money decides who even gets on the stage now. And it's wrong. Jerry and Kim, you've been uh, sitting, listening to this. What do you, what do you make of this and uh, your own views about what we saw in the movie and the condition that we're discussing tonight? Well, you can imagine it's daunting for me to be up here. I'm, I think I was selected as the every person, every person, small business person. Um, I have been active um, at least in terms of being interested in politics since I was a little girl. And I come from a family that um, was in support of politics over the years. Um, and at one time, my dad worked for Common Cause, who is a part of the group putting this group on this function on. And in the, you know, since I've been able to, I've been giving money, um, you know, not at some crazy kind of level, but at more than I ever had in the past. And every time I find myself thinking, surely there's a better way than this way. There are progressive things that I want for this country. I want kids who need to go to Head Start to be able to do that. I want clean air, I want clean water, and I can't sit by, I just can't do it and do nothing about that. But I always have this sort of uneasy feeling like I'm compromising what matters to me because it is so divisive and 527 money does pay for bitter ugliness and lies. Yeah. and. Um, and so, you know, I'm here tonight because I believe that we have got to speak up about some other way to make this happen. At New Belgium, it was mentioned that um, we're employee-owned, we practice high involvement culture, and we practice open book management. All of my coworkers know where all of the money goes in our company. That creates, between that transparency and they're expected to participate in the business of running the business, that creates this alignment and trust and sort of community of people who are all focused in one direction. And you can kind of apply that same thinking if you talk, you know, rather than if you talk about transparency in elections and if you talk about insisting that our citizens be involved in the process of electing their representatives. That's that same kind of, we're in this together. We're, we're, we know where we're going and, and we will have differences of opinion, but we all trust in one another as Americans to want the right thing. And I think the one that I would add that you alluded to was um, access to stories that are not the truth. You know, I think there are a lot of people who hear what is entertainment as being, you know, the facts of the matter. And I mean, some of the people, and, and I think Brian was, you know, masterful in, in the interviews that were conducted, but some of those people scare me. You know, people who say, I don't think he's an American. I think he's a socialist. He's, you know, run us down the road to ruin. They don't call him my president. He's, he's our president. And I find that kind of disrespect for the man and for the office appalling. 
Um, so, you know, and then you have Citizens United, and here we are. Um, it, you know, we have just been through a period where we've seen lack of regulation and lack of transparency and the incredible devastating effect it's had on our economy. And we're, you know, with Citizens United, we're headed right back there. And, and so we will perhaps put clean water at risk because the people who are paying for elections you know, find that kind of, the kind of extractive industries that they're perhaps in, it's useful that, for them to take those kinds of regulations away. And they bought it, and they will be able to make that happen. And I'm concerned about that, and I, I read Howard Schultz's thing, and I say, on the one hand, Howard, I agree with you. You know, I don't want to give money if we can't do this well. And on the other hand, I can't sit by, you know, and watch the whole thing fall apart. So I'm, an, I'm, um, I'm not a lawmaker. Um, I'm, I've never been a politician. I hope to, I pray to God I'll never be one. <laughs> um, but I'm a citizen who's concerned about the way that um, we show up as um, fellow citizens in our country. And so that's why I'm here. I, well, this might be your first political step. I want to yeah, I want to no, get sir, into that, that a little bit more. Not. Citizens United, but I want to wanted to give Jerry an opportunity to weigh in. Think about this. Two nights from now, in Denver, we're going to listen to our two presidential candidates, and they're going to talk about domestic policies and what they want to see happen. And. The clearest way I can tell you my own feelings, they're both going to lie to us. They're going to act like they have the power to implement what they want to get done. And yet, they're going to have to go through an intransigent U.S. Congress. And they're not going to be willing to tell us how they're going to move the U.S. Congress to their will. And I fully support the statement that has been made that money is the source of this problem. I've never really confirmed this, but I'd be willing to offer a bet. You know, former President Carter has a, a, an election monitoring uh, arm, a foundation. Other countries call on that group <coughs> to monitor elections. And they, the Carter Group, have a minimum threshold or they won't go to monitor an election. And the minimum standard is that that country cannot, ha cannot have bribes as a way of influencing elections. And I'll just bet you that the Carter Group would not be willing to monitor a U.S. election. Think about that. We are the greatest country in the, on Earth, but by gosh, we're not perfect. I'm th I think about a statement, a famous statement, Winston Churchill made about <coughs> us, about we Americans. Sure, go get you right napkin. The Americans will always come to the right answer, but only after they've tried everything else. <laughs> So I think about this issue. It's pretty easy to, to define. It's ever bigger amounts of money by ever more strident special interest groups that are causing this distortion. So how do we fix it? I, I know there, that there are plenty of people in, in the audience and here on stage who have looked at, watched, and been trying their, their part to fix this problem for many years. My opinion, the judiciary will not solve this problem. Lots of efforts have been made, and the latest came, out, came in the form of, uh, of these terrible, uh, big uh, uh, money pools that yeah, have been authorized, guys. the super pools. So, what does that say to us? The judiciary is stuck on a view that standing for free speech 
is more important than stopping the billions of dollars of corruption? I'm not a lawyer either. I don't like the answer that came away, though, that we came away with. There have been lots of efforts at legislation, and they have failed. Now, why is that? My best guess? Incumbents, senators, congressmen, on both sides of the aisle, get more campaign money than their opponent, who, who for the first time is trying to run for office. So why would they want to stop what's going on? So what, what can be done? What, what, what can we do to fix the problem? And my answer is a phrase from a, another place, just say no. We, this is our country. If you want to give money to a candidate, fine, but don't let it go through the hands of a bundler. Give it directly to the candidate. Don't let some guy pick up 10 of you and say to that candidate, listen to me now, because I'm, I'm the guy that collected this from 10 people. And, if, and if, you're, if you're really mad enough, stop buying products from corporations that are, that are putting the most money into campaigns. And if, you, um, if you're a member of a union and your union gives money to campaigns, I, I know, you gotta join a union in some cases, but you can sure yell like hell to your union leaders about whether they ought to still be your leaders if they're giving money like that. Just say no. You know, we have this court decision, Citizens United, that established, or actually it sort of reestablished a principle that had been in law for a hundred years or so, that a corporation has the similar rights to those individual when it comes to the First Amendment. Governor Romer, I know that you know, you've said that there are many things that we could do uh, that would be still in keeping with Citizens United or, or not going the route of a constitutional amendment. Why don't you share with the... Uh, I loved Abraham Lincoln. He was my favorite president. Didn't know him personally, but read a lot about him. <laughs> he, he said something interesting once when I asked a question, what American document guides you? And he didn't say the Constitution. He said the Declaration of Independence, it can't be amended. That was his answer. Hmm. I mean, there are certain principles here. The Supreme Court can rule however it wants to. The Supreme Court ruled in 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson. Remember, separate but equal is fine. It took us 58 years to overcome that. That was the Brown versus the Board of Education. So we might have to grapple with Citizens United with a constitutional amendment. And while better minds than I, I'm not a lawyer, I did go to Harvard and I apologize for that. Uh, at, and the Harvard Business School, but I'm not a lawyer. I'm a, I'm a farmer and a small town banker. But while the big minds talk about the constitutional amendment, I talk about things that Congress can do tomorrow afternoon to change this. And let me talk about just two or three quickly. Full disclosure can be required. It says so in the ruling of Citizens United that direct contributions can be limited and regulated. It says it. And it says that disclosure can be required. Congress doesn't have the courage to do it thus far. That's why it takes a president free to lead to enact these things and present them to Congress. Full disclosure, 48-hour reporting. Disclosure's fine, theoretically, but if you wait until after the election to disclose, it has no value, does it, Hank? So I would have 48-hour reporting. In this electronic age, that's plenty of time to report the information. Full disclosure, that applies to PACs. That applies to super PACs. That would apply to every American and every corporation if you keep corporations as individuals. Full disclosure, 48-hour reporting. No lobbyist can bring a check. They have to be registered in Washington. We do regulate who can lobby. Well, we ought to require that it would be criminally illegal 
for a lobbyist to bring a check or participate in a fundraiser. You'll see some difference there. We ought to have a five-year window by which retiring members of Congress or defeated members of Congress can't take a lobbying job in Washington. That would change it. I know a list. I'll limit myself to Louisiana, and I know a list of former congressmen who are lobbyists. I mean, this is, this is the game, how you get rich. I could go on, but there are five or six or seven specific things that don't require a constitutional amendment that you could change America and do it next year. If either candidate for president, I'm talking about Democrat or Republican, and by the way, neither party is mentioned in the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence. I think we can do better than both. I've been in each of them, 20 years in one, 20 years in the other. They're just the same. They're addicted to the money, okay? But if Obama gets reelected, and he seems like a very decent guy, I like him. If he gets reelected, he could take this issue. If Mitt Romney, a very decent guy, like him too, if he got elected, he could take this an issue. But they won't balance the budget. They won't do tax reform. They won't do fair trade with China. They won't do deregulation of small business. They won't do the kind of jobs in energy that we knew. They, they won't do clean environment that creates. They won't do any of those things and do, the, do campaign reform first. It's the first thing, and don't let Citizens United stop you. We can do it without the Supreme Court. I want, as, let me second what Buddy said about disclosure. Absolutely essential. And I see in Colorado for the last six, seven years a, a group of billionaires who have funded smear campaigns against candidates for the state legislature and other offices who literally not only mistort, uh, distort the truth, but smear people to a point they don't even want to stay in the same community. Uh, state senators who have a million dollars spent to smear them, and it's done anonymously, and it's wrong. So, buddy, I couldn't support more your, your call for disclosure. And, and I might add, if you were going to make a list of members of Congress who don't lobby, it would be a very short list. It would be. Uh, and it's if not I catch you up there, Hank. They I'm aren't good point. People, it's because it pays so well to stay there. Yep. Let me ask you to think about something, though, as we go forward. If you're in business and you find a way to do away with your competition, would you support that? It's called regulation. I was in the packing, meat packing business as well as the cattle feeding business. Regulations made it impossible for small packers to continue to exist. Buddies in the banking business, small community banks, the new regulations will make it impossible for small banks to compete because of the level of regulation. <clears throat> and I'm not talking about ensuring there's clean water. I think there's a broad range of regulations we'd all agree on. I'm talking about regulations that go to the point where you have hundreds of thousands of pages of regulations where a small enterprise simply can't even read them all, much less comply with it. If you're in business and your survival depends on getting a government contract, do you donate to campaigns? The reason we've had an explosion in campaign spending and campaign donations is because we've had an explosion in the reach of government. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't do reasonable things, that we shouldn't help the poor. But the reason all of this has come about in the way of flood of money is because people's livelihood now depends on getting a contract from the government, now depends on getting the regulations they want from the government. And part of the solution of all of this is not just the things we've talked about, but part of the solution to all of this is to begin to think about what's reasonable regulation and what's not. To think about what we can't afford to spend and what we can't. To think about what kind of tax credits we give our friends and what we can afford. This begins with us and our appetite for services we don't pay for. Jerry, you were, you were in a regulated business. 
for a while. Talk about what Hank said. Well, I, I want to I uh, make a point about the, the insidious nature of what we've got here. I don't, I don't think for the most part that corporate heads or union heads really like this system. They, they almost like us, they'd like to get out of it. And, 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 and I, I, I do appreciate the point that you've made that big guys would like to stomp out little competitors and they can do it with, with too much regulation. But on balance, I believe that, that both corporations and unions, if they could find a way out, they would. And I'll, I'll share a story. I once, you know, we all get, we all hear from time to time, and, and I started to believe it. Quit saying that no one individual, uh, that an individual can't make a difference. And I set out to get CEOs of major corporations, started Fortune One all the way down to 500. I was setting out to get them, CEOs, to just say no. Incidentally, I got, cl I got my first one. It was Time Warner at the time. And they shut down all of their, their, their contributions to political causes, including all the sideshows, giving money for conventions and all that. And, it, and two years later, they came away with the view that it didn't change anything about their business. But that may be rare. I got down to about 25 of the big guys and some of them said, I won't tell you names, well, wait a minute, I'm a government contractor, and if I'm going to say no, my competitors have to say no. And I said, okay, I'll call them. And I was making progress, and some of the unions started to say, we'll say no, but the, the corporation that we're trying to, to unionize has got to say no, too. And we started to make some progress, and then Enron happened. Most of you are old enough to know about Enron. And, I, and, and there was this stir in Washington to identify those bad guys in corporations that were just like Enron. And all my guys got scared, though they had no reason to be scared, and they withdrew their pledge to say no. Wow. And that's what happened. So I, that's my way of saying there, I believe there are smart ways to find a way that the, that the influence first comes from individuals and the private sector to just say no. Woman, do, how do you react to what, when you see calls for, for curtailing corporate donations? Does that bother you at all as a businesswoman? You've, fairly recently begun making your own contributions. Well, I find myself thinking, you know, with the, with the lack of transparency we have, if I'm a stakeholder, an employee in a company, or a shareholder, or I'm on the board of directors, and um, I really have no way of knowing if that CEO, there are ways to, you know, hide those kinds of contributions. I really have no way of knowing if a CEO has decided to make an outsized corporate uh, contribution to a particular candidate. Um, and I think that's a little bit troubling. Jerry, you suggested that people should not buy products from, I'm not sure if that's me, or should not buy products from companies, you know, who are donating money, but, they, but we don't know who's donating money and who's not. I also, in this discussion, found myself thinking that also looking at tax um, law, my simplifying the tax code might be useful here as well because there's certainly, you know, figuring out regulation, but there's also, when you hear that um, major U.S. corporations have offshored all of their profits and pay nothing in taxes, I, I have trouble with that. I think that's a problem. And I think as shareholders, and many of us are unwitting shareholders in those very corporations, um, I think we need to stand up and, you know, there are a lot of angles 
from which this needs to be worked. Um, and I think that's probably another one as well. For me, um, my company obviously could now give money to uh, political causes, and we don't do that. We always give beer. Um, no matter what side you're on, we always give beer. So, because that's, that's an American, that's an American drink that's made here in America by Americans um, who have jobs that can't be offshored, by the way. Good for you. Uh, I want to get into a couple of, I'm not working, yes I am. Um, I'd like to get into a couple areas but before we go into audience questions, so be thinking of your questions here. One is the, the role of the, the news media, uh, and Senator Brown, you and I were talking a little bit about that uh, earlier. How, what role has the, the way in which the news media, and I'm talking, really I'm talking about the so-called nonpartisan news media, uh, that the, how they've covered political campaigns. Uh, th talk, talk about that and, and has that had an effect on cheapening the political discourse? I think it's a heartbreaking development. It is what it is, but uh, I think as all of you know, our newspapers are in trouble. Uh, they've had a, a dramatic cutback in revenue and they've responded by dramatic cuts back in staff. I noticed it in the political process, uh, when I served in the state legislature and the state senate, it had good coverage from the news media. And when I say good, not necessarily pro me or against me or for my party or against my party, but I mean solid coverage in terms of describing the issues and covering the issues. Um, and interestingly enough, a lot of times legislators would read the paper the next day to find out what they did. Um, sometimes to find out what they said uh, with it. Uh, that's changed, and it's changed in Washington. When I went to Washington, the matters that we legislated on were so, so detailed, uh, so thorough, that uh, you often had reporters simply report what someone said rather than what the facts were. <coughs> Buddy, I know that you may have noticed this at times, but it led to a whole different discussion because if someone would say something inaccurate or make a wild charge, it would be carried. But unlike in the state legislature where the, le where the reporter would say, Tom Jones says the bill does this, but he didn't read on the second page where it doesn't do that, uh, it would simply carry he says, she said kind of stories. And the change in our media, I think, has dramatically harmed the political process. It's harmed it because the facts aren't presented. Uh, it's harmed it because legislators aren't held accountable for the accuracy of their remarks and the way they used to be. And I think it's harmed the, de the debate because uh, much of it has become entertainment, as we all know. And that means that if you say something a little silly or a bit outrageous, uh, or how many times have you heard someone say they're outraged, it tends to get covered. And if you give a thoughtful <coughs> comment about something, uh, you never see it, uh, partly because it's not entertaining. There are answers to this, but it's a huge problem, I think, in our representative democracy uh, to have a loss of that kind of coverage, uh, and it harms the quality of what happens. You know, in the broadcast journalists, I mean, they can almost tell minute by minute who's watching what. And, you know, that's why you have these scandalous stories, you know, leading the, 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 you know, even the, legitimate, the legitimate news media. I mean, this, for a lot of people, politics isn't that interesting. Government isn't that interesting, right? Mm -hmm. what, what do you do about that? You can't force people to read newspapers. God knows we've tried the business <laughs> journal. <laughs> you can't force them. And, and that's what's happened with a lot of the dailies. The reason they've lost advertising revenue is their readership has gone down. How do you bring them back? You know, one of the things that's kind of interesting, uh, it was a discussion of America in the 1830s uh, where the observation was made that as long as schools are controlled locally, the local newspaper uh, will have strong readership. And at a point where you lose control of the schools and the implication being control of issues locally, 
local newspapers will die. That was an observation made by a Frenchman in 19, 1830. But I think it's come true today. As you have a loss of control of issues on the local level, you tend to have a loss of the local media that, that services that. Part of the answer, I think, is to rethink uh, the way we decide things in America and re-empower local government. You know, the, in the last oh, decade or two... Like to okay. From a more maybe um, pragmatic... One of the reasons that I'm here is because I think it's important that Americans talk about what they believe in in a fairly civil kind of way. And I think that we don't honor that so much anymore. I think that we don't, it's not okay for people to, you know, oh, politics and religion, we don't talk about those things. And I think we kind of need to set the standard that um, caring about what happens in your community is important. And um, yes, you have to go to work and get kids to school and all of those things. But, you know, way back we were talking about um, the team of rivals, the uh, book about Abraham Lincoln. People read a lot about politics then. They didn't have nearly so much to do, but it was an important part of every citizen's life. And um, I, think, I think reintroducing that notion that citizenry is a part of all that we're expected to do, um, you know, each of you should have a conversation with someone about being a citizen. And I appreciate it that you've all come here today as citizens to hear what we have to say and to watch what I thought was a very good film. On that point, I think people are disconnected from politics. Yeah. I think we have no faith that they, that they would lose for a reason. That they would actually stand on the floor and say, forget my party. I'm building a nation. Come with me. I, I think people have no faith in that anymore. And it comes back to the money. People know they're not important. Kim, they know that. When Barack Obama and John McCain ran for president, they got more money from lobbyists with Washington, D.C. addresses than they did from 34 states combined. But I think that Barack Obama and John McCain do believe in people. I, I, and that is not to suggest that the system is not screwed up, because it really is. But I think that both of those men were honorable men who want the kinds of things I want. Maybe in various shades of one versus another. But I, don't, I, I couldn't tell you that I would think of either one of those men as basically corrupt and driven. Can, can I give an example? I, I don't know if this helps. Buddy, I think of it, and I, I admit I have a different point of view. When you come to Congress, you have all sorts of things you get to vote on. One of them is the tobacco bill. We have a bill that says it doesn't subsidize tobacco, but it helps tobacco. At the same time, we have a program to urge people not to use it. Use tobacco. That's crazy. Now, it, it doesn't mean we're just schizophrenic. When people come to Washington, nobody votes for the tobacco bill. Oh, if you're from North Carolina, you might. Uh, and I think there's a district in, in southern o Ohio that has tobacco. But nobody votes for the tobacco bill. After they've been there 10 years, 99% of the people in Congress vote for the tobacco bill. And it makes Buddy's point. They trade votes. And they trade votes because one group comes in and supports people if they'll vote for their special interest. And it's how yeah. this nightmare of trading favors and coming up with idiotic programs. And, and please don't think I'm exaggerating when I say hundreds, perhaps thousands of idiotic programs. We have a farm program to urge people to plow up fragile grassland, and we have another program that pays you to take fragile grassland that's been plowed up and put it back in grass. <laughs> I can give you a hundred examples of that, but it all comes from people bringing from special interest money that influences good people 
and in time, if people stay in Washington long enough, they end up voting for the tobacco pill or whatever stupid bill you want to talk about. The biggest contributor and, to Barack Obama yeah. was General Electric. You know who the biggest contributor to John McCain was? General Electric. You know who made $15 billion net profit last year and paid no taxes? Zero. General Electric. Congress doesn't write the tax bill. The lobbyists do. The lobbyists do. I've been there. I stood eight years in the Congress. I voted against the Speaker, and he was in my party, Tip O'Neill. I'm the only Democrat that voted against him. I organized a group called the Bull Weevils, who worked with Reagan when we thought he was right. That was about 64% of the time, if you want to check the record. But we did what needed to be done, America first. Here's what I'm saying. I'm not saying I'm the only patriot or you or you. We're all patriots. But the people in power are addicted to the money. They have to get the money to get reelected. Barack Obama fussed about super PACs for four years, and what, guess what he did three months ago? He directed the members of his cabinet to go, go raise money for a super PAC. Mitt Romney, while he was in Massachusetts, said he was against PACs and super PACs. Guess what he did? He went and addressed the fundraiser of his own damn super PAC. They're bought. And what we've got to focus on, Kim, what we've got to focus on is the money. There are other problems, no question about it. I introduced in 1981 a bill for term limits. I mean, that's reform in my opinion. There's a lot of things we need to do, but if we start with the money or nothing else will happen. Jerry, I, 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 I just wanted to add, I, I just wanted to add a, a dimension to this discussion about it's kind of like, why aren't we really asking where did all the leaders go? Um, I remember, I love this guy. I think most of us love this guy. I still love this guy, Paul, Paul Volcker. And he showed me a chart. Uh, it went back to 1960. And it was a survey that has been, has been the same survey has gone on now every year. I haven't seen it in 10 years. But the survey asked the question, do you, ha do you have trust in your blank? And, and the blanks are your president, your union leader, your cor corporate CEO. I don't know, there are about five of yeah. them. And every one of those lines, the trend line year by year, keeps going down. Why is that? Why do we no longer, as Americans, have faith in our leaders? And I think we keep coming back to Money corrupts. Yep. It's not just government, guys. It's money corrupts. But doesn't the money buy a message that the people are vulnerable to, you know, believing? I mean, don't we, you know, we still have the power of the vote. And, you know, we've always had term limits, Governor. You know, you can vote the person out in the next yep. election. But the money buys access to give a message to, as Senator Simpson said, green pea people. Yeah. Who you know, aren't paying attention most of the time. Well, we got to get off the couch, Neil. I mean, hell, I'm 68. I ran for president. I had no chance. I've been out of politics for 20 years. I mean, I can give a pretty good speech every now and then, and I, I can I and laugh and cry. But, you know, you just don't know me. So you've got to run for eight years. I'm not willing to do that, okay? I got a wife, I got kids, I got grandkids. I love Louisiana, y'all come visit sometime. It's a great <laughs> state. And we cleaned it up. Bobby Jindal's our governor, doing a great job. But here's my point. I decided to stand up so maybe you would. I started a project called the Reform project.org, the reform project Org. Get on my website, and I'm asking America. It's not about me. I'm not going to be president, but I want a woman who's free to lead to be president. I want a man free to lead to be president. And if we have to start somewhere, the first step is about the money. There are other steps that need to be taken. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not a one-issue guy, but there's a key to get in the room, and the key is the money and we start with full disclosure and 48-hour reporting, and we hang pictures on the wall.
I'm going to I'm going to invite Brian Malone up here uh, so that uh, he can join the. Uh, where is Brian? Brian, you around? He found his tie. Uh, yeah, there he, he is. He appears from backstage. Or he found someone's tie. Come on up, and then I'm, I want to open it up to questions. Um, let's <laughs> down here in the front. We get a it's mic down on the first row here. Oh, you're so good, honey. I can talk really loud. Thank you. Well, not loud, probably not loud enough. Acoustics are great in here, but uh, there's a mic right there for you. Same way. Brian? Yeah, I'm listening. Is it possible to he's, purchase he's busy a copy with the of this film to show in schools? Well, uh, would you hear the question? Yeah, the question was, can she buy a copy the of the movie to show in schools? Someone has to repeat the question. Yeah, repeat the question. Is it possible to purchase a copy of this film soon to show in schools? Why, yes. <laughs> yes, it is. Operators and it makes a great gift. Standing by. And there are videos available out, uh, outside. Uh, Did you yeah. plant that question? I uh, <laughs> yeah, that's sure. Embarrassing. Sure. Operators are standing by. Yeah, that's now. right. Uh, Hey, I just want to chime in a little bit. I know I'm not, uh, I, I, I'm just really thrilled to be on, uh, uh, sitting next to all these folks here. And I've heard a lot of great exchanges of ideas tonight. I just want to throw out a little notion of my own. And uh, to Senator Brown's uh, comment about we can't write a check, our, our, uh, our country can't cash. Uh, we need uh, clean uh, water and common sense regulation. All those things are true, and they all come from different sides of the aisle and different sides of the ideology, which is great. But I think that there's one thing, and you touched on a little bit, Senator, in the beginning, and that is it nice that we all get along and play nicely? That might be a nice idea. And I'm certainly not suggesting that there's a bit of naivete that I'm detecting, perhaps, uh, in, this, in this film because I have gotten the criticism of that before. But what I would say is, is this, is that, and I hope this isn't a liberal or a conservative idea, but I would say this, that we all collectively have to get off of this government is the problem bandwagon that we've been Amen. on for the last 30 years or so. And that if you look at every single bit, every single second of our day right now, you are, uh, you are uh, experiencing the benefits of your government at work right now. The roads that you drove on to get here, the safe roads, that you, the sidewalks that you, that you walked on, this beautiful safe building that has passed all the building codes are all a result of your tax dollars at work. And I, need, I, I think we really need to get off of this idea that taxes are bad and that, and that your government is the enemy because there is not one of us that doesn't benefit from the government every single minute of every single day. And I would argue also that this whole idea about government regulation, and government jobs, well, let's think about how many jobs the government creates, not just directly, but back to your point about, the, about uh, uh, um, <laughs> government contractors. And let's face it, the biggest government contract, the biggest job provider in the state of Colorado, if I'm not mistaken, is one of the biggest DOD contractors in the nation, uh, Lockheed Martin. And, and we have to ask ourselves, if we do cut all, those, cut all that spending down, entitlements, defense, whatever, what, there, for every action, there is a reaction. And there are a lot of jobs that will be lost. So I think what, what, what I'm suggesting is, is that I don't know what the answer is, whether we, whether we cut those jobs and, or cut, that, cut those services or whatever. But I do think we all have to have a reckoning as to what our government does provide us and realize the value of it. I want to go up, up on the mezzanine up there. Great movie, by the way. Thank Can you. you. Me now? <clears throat> Any better? Okay. Uh, Ms. Jordan, you mentioned a sense of civic responsibility. And Governor Romer, you say stand up. And Mr. Greenwald, you say say no. Well, <clears throat> my questions are this. Stand up on what? Say no to what? How do I know? When do I stop valuing money more than education? When do I start valuing a sense of community 
and civic responsibility more than money. When did we start valuing money more than education and civic responsibility? Why can't we get to that point? And let's dig a little bit deeper than just saying, oh, we're gonna solve this for now. It'll be a great symptom to solve. But until we get back to those points, we're just gonna keep dealing with this over and over and over again. I, I couldn't disagree with you more. Uh, it, it's not, uh, uh, if I understood your question correctly, uh, it's not about Barack Obama or John McCain or Mitt Romney. Uh, none of them are corrupt. It's a system that's corrupt. Now, if you like what's happening in this country right now, don't get involved. Let it go. Don't stand up. Don't say no. If you like what this country's right now, 14 million unemployed, 8 million additional people have quit looking for work that want a job, 15 million are working part-time, cannot feed their own families. That is a significant portion of America, and it's gotten worse. There are more there were more people working in America in 1999 than there were this year, and there are 43 million more Americans. We are a nation in trouble, and all I'm doing, just speaking for my little 68-year-old self, is that I'm trying to get the attention of the American people because they can change the system. I can't. I want a president who challenges the system. I thought Obama would. He has not. I want a president <coughs> free to lead, a woman or a man, I don't care what party, who will challenge the system, who will ask Congress to do their best, who will change the campaign finance laws, and a president can get that done. So I am very specific. I'm not general. I am very specific. If we don't change the money first, nothing else will follow. Look at, look at the example. Bill Clinton was elected, did away with Glass-Steagall, brought about the collapse of 2007. George Bush was elected from an opposite party, bailed out all the big banks. Barack Obama kept both those things in the law. It's, it's this party, it's that party, it's this party, it's that. We keep doing a variation of the same thing and we're getting the same results. Change the system and you'll get different results. America could have a boom. It could have a boom if we did six or seven things from tax policy all the way to fair trade with China. It would have a boom in this country. But first, it's campaign reform. Let, I'd answer it this way. Our elected officials uh, there, there may, may be a few exceptions, but they're, they're all honest people. We need to take the money away. We need to, we need to take the money away from, the, from campaigns so that they don't have to come beg for money and make promises that they shouldn't want to make or don't want to make. And the only way I know, and this is where I guess there are some disagreements across this panel, I don't think we better count on the Supreme Court to solve the problem. I agree. And I don't think we ought to count on the U.S. Congress to pass new legislation for us. I think we ought to take it in our own hands. And when we get asked, don't give them any money. If you feel badly that they're going to zero, fine. You write them a check, but hand it to them. That's all <laughs> I'm saying. Okay. Can, I just, can I just chime in on that a little bit? I think you hit on something a little bit, Jerry, that I'd like to... Um, first of all, let me just say this. It took a lot of time to try to answer your question. What do you believe in? It took a lot of time for us to get this dysfunctional. It's taken a, a lot of inside baseball, a lot of, a lot of rigging of the system uh, through uh, laws that, 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 you know... Congressman Edwards is trying, is suggesting to undo uh, Congressman Cooper. Um, there's some, they're not very sexy. It's not as sexy as Fifty Shades, I'm sorry, but, but those are the things that need to be done from the inside out uh, that, are, that are inside Congress. And just from talking, talking to some folks in Washington about this, um, it's gonna take time. But the other side of that equation is, is that now is the time where we need you the most. And, 
you all come in here tonight is the first step. Uh, and, and honestly, if you will continue to apply public pressure, uh, it, the will of the people will prevail. It's going to take some time. I'm sorry, I guess he's not buying it. But uh, <laughs> it, 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 the will of the people will prevail. It will take time. Right? And so I'm going to ask everyone, we've got, we got to be patient. We've got to be patient and give ourselves time to unravel the tightly wound knot that we've wound up for ourselves over the last several years. Let me be the only guy that disagrees here. I don't think we have time. I think we need to get on to this. Now, now we're not going to get it all done tomorrow. But you know when we ought to start? Today. And you have to pick a first step. And my first step would be a president committed to reform. And if we don't get that, then we'll go directly to Congress on projectreform.org and we will center ourselves in Washington. There are 150 members of Congress who already hang by this on both sides of the aisle. And we're going to add to it. Watch us do this. It might not be a headline, but we will get this done. And when we do, then we can tackle our systemic problems, the budget, taxes, trade, banking, health care. We live in a nation where you can't afford to be sick. Something's wrong with that. We then can get after the real problems. You know what you need, okay. buddy? What? We got you time for one more question here, buddy. As, uh, I as you we out. said, uh, <laughs> there's going to be a reception out here, and everybody's going to be there, so this you can uh, yes, that up there in the, in the balcony. Hey, I really was next, and I am impatient. Uh, I have a question, but I, I agree with the governor. Um, the se what he said about Brian's two comments, uh, first of all, about the government, and secondly, about impatience, I couldn't disagree with Brian more. My question is, one of the topics was the issue of re redistricting, and so I just wondered what someone had to say about that is one of the solutions to our problem. That may be bigger than campaign contributions and disclosure. It is, and, and as important, no question about it. I mean, if you had to pick three steps, you would pick redistricting, because now, guess how we do it? A party that controls the legislature redistricts in their favor. What kind of country is this? Uh, uh, but I agree. You, 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 you also have this problem of, uh, of campaign contribution reform, which I think is the most important. But you have redistricting and you have term limits. Those are three general reform ideas. There are some around the country, and we're, we're, we have organizations all over the country now working on this. There are some who feel we need to do all three together. There's some who need to feel that there's a certain priority. It's my belief now, having served in Congress as a Democrat, having served as governor of a corrupt state, Louisiana, when I was elected, where there were no limits. I set my own limits when I ran, took no PACs, raised less than $2 million and beat a guy who'd been elected governor three times, had never lost, and spent 20 million. We beat him, beat him with 1.6 million. It can be done. I think you start with the money, but don't misunderstand me. We don't stop there. That's where we start. Okay, I think this, we've run way guy's... over, and I wanna thank everybody for being here tonight, and please thank our panel here, Jerry Greenwald. <laughs> Brian Malone, Thanks Governor Scott. Buddy Romer, Kim Jordan, and Senator Hank Brown. Thanks for everybody. And there's a reception in the lobby, I believe. Thank I'd you. also like everybody to thank Neil Weingart. <coughs> sorry, sorry, to thank oh. Will, Neil Westergaard for the wonderful job he's done. Give him a round oh. of applause. Thank you. And I, want to th I also just want to leave with one message to, to, um, to support everybody has oh, said here. Man. It's up to you. Listen to the debate in two nights. Listen to all the debates, but if you go out of here and do nothing, nothing is going to happen. And, I, and as I'm the last one speaking, I'm going to make a last plug. Somebody's asked, what can you do? We have literature out th there for Americans for Campaign Reform. We believe in small donor funding, public funding. Go out there and do something. Contact us, contact people. If you don't do it, it's not going to happen. 
there's no end game in democracy, and it's also not a spectator sport. They're counting on you not doing something. Show them they're wrong. Um, we have a reception um, in Joy Burns Plaza, where Brian Malone will um, be there. The film will be available, the extended director's cut will be available, which is longer than this one, and he will be there, and you can buy it there, and he will sign it. So I thank you all for coming. Go out and make this your democracy.